when you settle down with the breath, and the mind is willing to stay here, watching the breath consistently, making it smooth all the way in, all the way out. It's food for the mind. And it's good food. It's food inside. It's not food out in the world. You get a sense of well-being, a sense of ease, of being soothed by the breath when you need to be soothed, energized when you need to be energized, relaxed when you're tense. There are a lot of ways that the breath can bring things into balance. In the sense of, well, sense, <clears throat> sense of well-being that comes with that, it comes with a good intention, a sense of ease and comfort. It's a good place for the mind to stay, a good place for the mind to feed. Otherwise it goes feeding out in the world, and when you start feeding out in the world you run into conflict with other people. The Buddha says that before he began his quest he had a vision of the world. It's like a stream drying up and is filled with fish fighting one another over, over the water. Of course, the water was going to run out, and the fish were all going to die anyhow, and yet they keep fighting. He said he looked everywhere in the world, he couldn't find anything that wasn't laid claim to. Where was he going to find a happiness that he didn't have to fight other people for? And then he realized that the problem lay within. But the solution also lies within. And this is one of the beginning steps, is learning how to feed off of the sense of well-being that you can create inside as you watch the breath. Adjust it here, adjust it there, figure out what kind of breathing feels good right now. And then as the needs of the body change, you keep up with that. Think of that sense of well-being spreading through the body. Think of it going down the spine, going down the legs, down to the tips of the toes, the spaces between the toes, and going down your arms, down to the fingers. starting in the middle of the chest, right at the heart, and then going down through the stomach and the intestines. This is good nourishment, because you don't have to fight anybody for it, and it's right there, and it's free. And it's very immediate. When you get familiar with the breath and the different ways of breathing, you find that whatever you need in terms of being soothed, energized, whatever. You can provide yourself with that. This is one of the ways in which you lift yourself above the world. Because as long as we're looking for food in the world, we're under its power. The mind becomes a slave to the world, a slave to craving. And as the passage just now said, the world is really insufficient. And there's another spot where the Buddha said that even if it rained gold coins, it wouldn't be enough for the needs of the heart, the desires of the heart. But the kind of food that the world can provide. But if you provide the mind with the food that comes from concentration, the food that comes with discernment, the heart will achieve a state of satisfaction, a sense of enough that the world can never su never supply. So this is where we look. We look within. And we try to maintain this quality of the heart. Don't let the world come in and smother it. But it is important that you have this independent source of food, because otherwise you keep going back to the food offered by the world. And then the world can order you around. The Buddha has some images for the mind that's learned to find a sense of well-being inside. One of the images has to do with discernment. He says it's like being up in a tower, looking at people down below. You've got your food up in the tower, you don't have to fight them for their food. And then you see them fighting, and it's sad. 
but at the very least you're not involved in the fights. The mind is lifted up above him. The Buddha also compares the, the mind that's well fed with the earth, and compares it with a large river like the Ganges, and compares it like space. And here it has to do both with the qualities of goodwill that you try to maintain for the world, and your sense of patience and endurance. The Buddha tells a story of a woman one time who had a reputation for being mild and good-mannered. And she had a slave who was very good at her work. And the slave began to wonder, is this woman really mild-mannered on her own, or is it because my work is good? Why don't I test her? So she started waking up later in the day. And the woman scolded her for waking up late. And the slave said, ah, yes, there is, there is anger present in my, in my master. How about if I test her some more? So she woke up even later in the day, and then later in the day, until finally the, the woman who owned the slave beat her over the head with a rolling pin. So the slave went with her head broken open and told all the neighbors, look at the handiwork of this woman who you said was so mild and good-mannered. The Buddha told this story as a lesson. You want to learn how to make the goodness of your heart something that's not dependent on other people's goodness. Otherwise, when things outside don't go well, then the goodness in your heart gets destroyed. And one of the things that really destroys it is the unkind words of other people. We want other people to like us, we want them to respect us, and we find that they don't. It bothers us. Well, we've been feeding on their words. And as John Lee says, when they say bad things to you and you feed on them, it's like they've spit something out on the ground. You pick it up and eat it. And then you get sick, and who are you going to blame? Because you were the one who picked it up and ate it. The fact that there's bad food out there doesn't mean you have to eat it. This is why it's good to have this independent source of nourishment inside. The Buddha went on to give a series of similes. He said, you want to make your goodwill as large as the earth. People can come and spit on the earth and urinate on the earth and dig on the earth and try to make it be without earth, but the earth is just too big. Their efforts seem puny in comparison. You want your goodwill to be that large. Even when people say unkind things, you just rem remember this is the way speech is in the world. There's kind speech and there's unkind speech, well-meaning and ill-meaning. When people criticize you, sometimes it's with a good intention, sometimes they just want to criticize you to be nasty. That's just the way human speech is. So don't take it personally. And don't let it have an effect for your goodwill, because after all, you have goodwill for other people both for their own good and also for ours. We have goodwill because we realize if we don't have goodwill for certain people, we're going to behave in unskillful ways to them, and then that's going to be our karma. So we have goodwill, wishing their happiness, both as our own protection and as protection for them. The Buddha went on to say, make your goodwill as large as the river Ganges. People can bring a torch and try to burn it up, but it's not going to work. The river Ganges puts out the torch. He said, make your, line, <coughs> excuse me, make your mind like space. People can try to write things on space, but there's nothing there to catch their words. So when people say things to you, think of your mind as being like space. What they say just doesn't stick. If you let it stick and take it home and think about it, again, you've gathered up what they've spit out and you're taking it home to feed on. So don't let it stick to begin with. And finally, he says, even if people, were <coughs> bandits, were to pin you down and try to saw off your arms and legs with a saw, if you had ill will for them, he said, you wouldn't be following his teachings. 
to follow the Buddhist teachings, even in a situation like that, you'd have to have goodwill for them, and then from that spread it out to all beings. Why is that? If they got you pinned down, there's nothing much you can do to prevent what they're doing. But you can make sure that your mind doesn't do anything unskillful, because you don't want to be reborn through the power of ill will. It creates just a miserable birth for you. You want to make your mind larger than the events of the world. And that way it doesn't have to be pushed around by the world. So these are some perceptions to hold in mind. Remember we talked about the power of perception in shaping your experience. As the Buddha said, if you can keep this image in mind, that even if people were sawing your limbs off, then if someone says something nasty to you, you can say, well, at least they're not sawing my limbs off. There was a monk one time who was going to go to a savage part of India. He went to say, take his leave of the Buddha. And the Buddha said, you know, the people there are really savage. What if they say nasty things to you? The monk said, well, I think these people are very nice and civilized, and they're not hitting me with their fists. What if they hit you with your fists? I'll say these people are nice and civilized, they're not hitting me with stones. What if they hit you with stones? I'll say these people are nice and civilized, and they're not stabbing me with a knife. What if they stab you with a knife? I'll say these people are good, and they're not killing me. What if they kill you? I'll tell myself, at least my death wasn't a suicide. And when I said, okay, you're, you're ready to go there. In other words, it's the perceptions you hold in mind, the ways you talk to yourself, can make all the difference in the world. But you want to put yourself in a position where you can hold these perceptions in a sincere way, and talk to yourself in a sincere way. This is why we try to develop this sense of nourishment inside, so we don't have to worry about the words of other people, the actions of other people. We can see that they're a lot smaller than the state of our minds, because our minds are well fed and they have an independent source of food inside. This is how we enable ourselves not to be overcome by the world. We can maintain our goodness. It's too bad that this word, goodness, is something you rarely hear nowadays. A while back I looked up the word goodness on Amazon to see what kind of goodness they were selling, and it was all cookbooks, baked goods, cakes, pies, cookies, that kind of thing. That's the kind of goodness we have. But the Buddha is offering something much better, the goodness of the mind. He says, when you develop that and give it a good foundation. And then even when the body dies, the goodness doesn't die. That's when your mind is lifted up above events. Things happen that you like, things happen that you don't like. They don't have to leave an imprint on the mind. Think of your mind as being like space, large like space, unaffected by anything. because you've developed this inner nourishment. That's more than enough to sustain you.